Good evening. Uh, you guys may be seated. How are we all doing tonight? Only a few of you are still alive, it seems. <laughs> all right, well, um, tonight I want to talk about pleasing the Lord. That is my title, pleasing the Lord. Uh, we go through life, and uh, when it comes to our spiritual life, a few people tend to think, what can I do not to upset God? And that is the exact opposite of what we should be doing. We should not be seeking, oh, how close can I get to the line? Oh, how close can I get to not offending God? But instead, we should focus on how to please God or what can we do to please him. Our mindset should be focused on God's will, on what he wants from us, not what we desire. Because we were bought with a price, were we not? So, tonight, I'm going to break down uh, this sermon of mine into three parts. Um, it's going to be quite simple. The first part is things that do not please God. The second part, things that do please God. And finally, the third point, how to please God. Uh, we're going to jump into my first point, things that do not please God. And we're going to... Uh, read out of Romans chapter 8, verse 6 and through 8. Romans chapter 8, 6 through 8. And it says, For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Pretty straightforward, right? If you, you cannot please God if you are in the flesh. Why? Because it is hostile to God. It cannot follow God's law. And I want to jump to another passage where it describes the flesh or the works of the flesh. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. And it says... Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the things like these. I warned you, I warned you, and I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, another passage that describes the flesh as uh, those who are in the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. And in that, you're not pleasing God. And I want to break down some of these evidences um, because many people overlook them and not really get into them. Um, impurity and the sexual immorality, we all know what that is. How about sensuality? The definition for that is the enjoyment, expression, or pursuit of physical and especially more sexual. So like the desire to lust, the desire to seek after things that are physical in a sense. Idolatry, we all know, the worship of idols, anything that is not in the pursuit of God. If anything has a higher... Uh, importance to, to you than God, that is an idol to you. If you desire watching a show, then spending more time with God. If you desire hanging out with your friends more than spending time with God, idolatry. And I know I have a few things to work on. For me, it's YouTube. I stay too much on YouTube. I spend too much time on that, and I need to work on that. That's idolatry. I spend too much time on that, and not enough time spent with God, when I could be. Another, sorcery, we all know that, magic. And uh, that one's pretty straightforward, I believe. You know, don't deal in magic. Why? Because there's demons that power that. 
You know, that's how it works. In Africa, there's a bunch of witchcraft. And I've heard personal stories from people where a demon would haunt them because there's witches who curse someone. And uh, one of the ministers there tried to go and help this lady who was being uh, tortured by a demon. And she would say, every night, the demon would come and shake her house, would shake her house. And so she could never get sleep, so she could never have peace. And the ministers came, and they came into her house to pray for her. And they noticed something, and they noticed it was like, a, like one of those faces, those masks that the Africans have. And they're like, what's that? And the lady's like, oh, this is just a gift one of those people over there gave me. And one of those people was a witch. And they're like, that thing has to go. That thing is filled with magic. And uh, it's funny. She's like, okay, well, she tried to get rid of it. She tried to destroy it. No, it didn't work. She physically had to take it out of her house and throw it away to, to keep it away from her. And when she did that, she noticed that the demon wasn't too much as present or powerful because that magic wasn't there anymore in her house. And so those things exist. It does exist. It may not be present here because that's not what the devil uses in America prominently. He uses greed and lust more so here. And over there in Africa, more so things of that nature. Enmity. What is enmity? It is the state or feeling of being actively hostile or opposed to someone or something. So what does this have to do with God? Well, if you have those feelings towards God, if you oppose him, if you're hostile to him, we just read in Romans, the flesh is hostile to God. If it's hostile, it cannot submit to the law of God. And so if you have that enmity towards God, if you oppose him, how are you going to be able to submit to him? How are you going to be able to please him if you don't listen to him or follow him? Fits of anger. This one should be relevant to everyone, especially if you have siblings. How many times have you outbursted to your younger sister or sibling when they get on your nerves? That shows that you have very little self-control. When they keep nagging, you keep nagging you, and you're like, hey, back off. All right, I've had enough. And it's, it's a simple question they're asking you, but you don't want to answer it. They're just going to keep nagging, nagging, nagging. And what do you do? You outburst. Leave me alone. I just asked where the sauce was. You know, like, be aware of what you're doing. You know, be aware of how you respond to situations. Do you burst out, or do you just respond calmly? Uh, calmly? So be aware of that. That one is an easy one to miss. Fits of anger, you know, when you burst out. Rivalries, dissensions. Rivalries, everyone knows what a rival is. Dissensions, that's basically a disagreement that leads to discord, which is just basically discord is another word for disagreement. So a disagreement that leads to a disagreement. What's the point of having disagreements if they don't go anywhere, you know? What's the point of discussing things that don't bring forth fruit or anything, you know? You just can talk about uh, those, uh, what if, what if, what if, what if, and then someone's like, well, I don't like that way. What if I think about it this way? And then you're like, you start bickering with each other for what purpose? A what if? You know, there's no, that's, that's going to create the next thing, which is divisions. You know, and, you're, and if you start bickering over those things and it creates division, how can you be united? As a church, God calls us to be united, right? And if it calls, and if those things cause us divisions, that's a problem. Envy, envy, envy. It means resentful longing aroused by someone else's possessions. It's more than jealousy. You yearn for what that person has because you don't have it. Think of jealousy, but on the next level. When you're not happy with what God has given you, how do you think that makes him feel? Oh, God, this guy has this, this guy has that. Well, God is sovereign, is he not? He decides who to give what gifts to. You know, 
as he gave that person five talents, the other two, and the other person one talent. It's what God sees and what we don't see. And so don't be envious because someone else has a different talent or you think that talent is better. However, in God's eyes, they're more so equal. He loves us all the same. Does he not? All right. And then uh, drunkenness. Straightforward. Why is this an issue? Because you don't have, you won't have self-control. You lose your thoughts, your ways, and you do something stupid. You might end up in jail. You might end up hurting someone, yourself. And so drunkenness is not good because you're not in, in the correct state of mind. You don't have self-control in that moment. That's why it's not good. You know, so that. Orgies, I'm not going to explain that. And things of this nature. Um, some more sexual references, but those things are not good because they're impure. Because they're going to lead you down a path that's not going to be good for you. And that's going to it's going to create a lot more problems because God calls us to be holy, to be set apart, to be different than the world. And the world enjoys those things, and so we are supposed to be different from them. We're supposed to be as God wants us to be. Um, another thing that does not please God, we find in Hebrews uh, chapter 11, verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God, must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. It is impossible to please without faith. Pretty straightforward. If you don't have faith, you cannot please God. Why? Well, what, why would you even listen to him if you don't have faith in him? How could you trust him if you don't have faith in him? So, those are a few examples of things that do not please God. And why did I bring up the flesh? We all know the saying, you cannot serve two masters. Well, in Matthew chapter 6, it clearly states that. Chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other one, or he will devote to one and despise the other one. You cannot serve God in money. In the same manner, you can substitute money for flesh in that manner where that could become your idol yourself and all those things that i mentioned before we cannot serve god and the flesh if you serve your flesh you do not please god those things are in the opposite trajectories holiness leads to god in life flesh leads to death and that's the opposite direction and so if you decide to please the flesh, you do not please God. And so what can we do? How can we make this applicable? The first step to solving any problem or issue ha you have is to what? Any guesses? Correct. Know that you have a problem. And look, each and every one of us, we have our own issues. We have our own things that we're going through. And so first and foremost, we need to question ourselves. What is that little thing that's, that keeps nagging me or with that big thing that keeps growing and growing and growing and growing? What is that thing that you're holding on to, that you're not letting go, that you're not giving to God, that you're not surrendering? So tonight, question yourself and don't let that issue grow. Why? Because as we see in Ephesians chapter 4, Verse 26 through 27, it says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. That is why. Because if you let that thing go and if you don't deal with it, it gives the devil an opportunity to establish a stronghold, to establish more issues in your life. Because if you don't make it go away, the devil comes back with it more and more and more and more. He's not going to let it sit. He's not going to, oh, no, it's fine. No. When he, when he has the opportunity, he's going to take it. And he's going to try to do anything he can to separate you from God and to take you to death. Away from God. All right? So the first step is recognizing that we all have issues. And that we should 
figure out what those specific issues are for each and every one of us. So I'm going to jump to my second point so we can find out the things that do please God. And I'm not going to list every single thing because there's a lot of things that please God. But these are a few things that I found interesting that please God. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 20, it starts off with what God doesn't like and then what he does. Those of a crooked heart are an abomination to the Lord, but those of blameless ways are his delight. His delight to be blameless. What is blameless? Innocent of wrong, wronging. Innocent of wronging. However, be careful of how you view the word blameless. Because in today's world, blameless, innocent of wrong, wronging, may mean something different to God than to the person of the world, right? The way God sees innocence versus how the world sees innocence are two different things. God asks us to be blameless in the manner of like being holy, to be set apart. Innocent in the view of the world is like you can do uh, drugs because the law says it's okay. You're innocent by the letter of the law. But God doesn't like that, right? So be aware of that. So one thing God likes is blameless, to be blameless. However, in his sight, not in the sight of the world. Another thing that pleases God, uh, Proverbs 12, 22. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithful, faithfully are his delight. What does it mean to act faithfully? It means to be honorable to be loyal, to be steadfast, to be reliable, to hold up your end of the word or the end of the bargain in a sense. Do you stick to your word? Are you a man of your word, a woman of your word? Or are, do you skimp whenever you're like, oh, I told you I was going to do this. Uh, never mind. I don't want to do it anymore. Do you act faithfully? Do you go through with what you stated, with the promises you made, especially to God? You know, we go through life and like, God, well, please help me in this situation. And if I do, I'm going to spend more time with you. Two months later, where is that promise? Did you do anything about it? Or were you just hoping that God would help you in that moment and then forget about your promise? God asks us to act faithfully. You know, be loyal to him. Be steadfast in your devotion to him. Act honorably towards those around you. Another thing that pleases the Lord is in Proverbs 15, verse 8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is acceptable to him. The upright, just another word for righteous. To be righteous in the sight of God. Simple enough. Another thing that pleases God and is found in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. This means when your sister asks for a chip, you give her a chip. Yeah. <laughs> so don't be shy to share. Okay, It says here, however, there's a second part to it. Such sacrifices are pleasing to God. You have to be careful there because there's a very important uh, word in that sentence. Sacrifices. It means to give up something of yours. And necessarily one chip is not necessarily a big sacrifice or something that costs you, right? But maybe going out of your, your way to help someone who doesn't have much. Who others don't look... Uh, greatly upon and helping them out when it takes your time when it takes your money it could be a friend going through a really bad time and you have to take work off to go help them because they're going through a really bad time you know sacrificing your time to go help those who need it do not neglect to do good and to share with others that's what God likes that's what pleases him uh, in first Kings chapter 3 verse 10 it, state, it says, it pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. Does anyone know, 
Does anyone remember what Solomon asked for? Wisdom. Wisdom. Now, why is God pleased about that? Because God asked or God told Solomon, ask anything and I ask of any one thing and I will give it to you. And Solomon said wisdom. And then he goes on to explain, because I need a way to be able to govern these people, to be, to be able to lead them the best way possible. He did not do it for himself. He did not do it. He could have asked for riches. He could have asked for so, much, so many other things, statue, power. But no, he asked for wisdom to lead God's people. And that's an important thing to remember. God was pleased because he asked for something that is not selfish. And I think we also should be aware of what we pray for. We should pray for selfless things. Pray for others, not always for yourself. It's not about you. It's about God and what you can do for him. So instead of asking, you know, God, help me with the test or help me with this. Yeah, sure, that's fine. That's not as important. What should be more important to you is how you can help your neighbor, how you can help your sister, your brother, those around you in church. And whenever the time comes, those you meet, strangers. What can you do to help them? Be aware of that because that's what God is, that's what God likes. And by being aware of these things, being aware of what God likes, we can jump to the second step in solving an issue. I don't follow the normal, all the normal steps. I break it down into three steps because I have three points. So the second step is to create a plan. So in the first part, we saw that, uh, that we need to recognize the issue. We need to find out what it is. And in the second part of solving that problem is you need to create a plan. You need to figure out that first problem that you're having, and second, and in that new plan that you're making, to figure out what you're going to do. How are you going to change? What implementations are you going to put into your life to start pleasing God and to stop doing the thing that is not pleasing God? So be aware of that. Make a plan and be like, okay, well, I can't do something gr grandiose or big right now at the moment. However, you can take little steps. You know, okay, well, maybe I can start off my day with a prayer. And I can uh, definitely end my day with a prayer. As it says, remember what it said in Ephesians, don't let the sun go down and you still be angry. Don't give the devil an opportunity. Well, how about you start praying more? Give more time to God and just speak with him. Look, God, today I messed up and, um, you know, I'm really mad because the things didn't go my way, but just talk with him, talk it out, and be more proactive in the manner of figuring out what is a, your stumbling block, what is your issue. You know, we each have one, so just talk with God, and he's going to help you through that. He's going to get you through that. And as we do this, we can get to my third point, which is how to please God. Uh, in Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 10, it says, And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. So, here Paul is writing to the Colossians, um, writing, and he's explaining, look, we've been praying for you, and we want you to be able to get filled with the knowledge of him in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you can walk in a manner worthy of what God has called you, so it's pleasing. And to do that, the results are bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Bearing fruit in every good work. 
Um, some people, some commentators break this down into two separate parts. Uh, they go bearing fruit uh, in the sense of the spirit of the fruit, like seeing that evident in your life, and also the calling that you have is your fruit. So for others, it may be uh, speaking, singing, and so forth. And however, I think you should combine the both, uh, combine them both, bearing fruit in every good work, the work that you were called to, and bearing fruit. And what does that fruit look like? What is the spirit of the, or what is the fruit of the spirit? And in Galatians chapter 5, 22 through 23 explains it. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, Faithfulness, kindness, or sorry, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Okay, so as you do the things that God has called you, are these fruits evident in your life? Are you gentle? Are you patient? Do you show love to your brothers and sisters in Christ, to those around you? Do you have self-control? Are these fruits evident in your life? And I have these three questions. <laughs> or one question I have is, do you bear fruit in every good work? Do you bear in the fruit that is shown here? Do you bear any of that? Do you show all of it? It's not easy to show all of it. But we need to, because this is what God gave. And if... We are his children. These are supposed to be evident in our lives. And in the second part of uh, Colossians, it said, increasing in the knowledge of God. Increasing in the knowledge of God. Do we daily take up the word? Do we increase our knowledge of God? Do we study the word? Do we get to know more? Do we know more about God each and every day? Or do we waste our time? Because it says fully pleasing to him, and it says increasing in the knowledge of him. That's what pleases him, to get to know him, getting to know him. Is your knowledge of God increasing? Is your knowledge of God increasing daily? And if so, what are you doing with that knowledge? You have a gift, right? You, you worship you preach, you help out in the back, you help set up things, whatever it may be. Does all of that intertwine? Does the way you does the way you act replicate the fruits of the spirit or not? We got to be aware of this. We got to be aware of what we do with our time and how we use it and what effects it has on us. Do we just read it and do nothing about it? So we got to be more aware. And if we're not aware, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it explains what to do. Do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So we have to not conform to this world, but we have to be renewed in our mind, and how do we do that? We do that by reading the word, by spending time with him, but why do you do that? So you can figure out what the will of God is for you. If you don't know the will of God, how can you please him? If you don't know what he's asking of you, how can you serve him? We need to transform our lives, and in a manner that pleases God by studying his word, actively spending time with him, and then applying those attributes we've learned into our lives. However, you first need to surrender to Christ. You need to surrender those things to him. Because if you don't, you're not going to go anywhere. You're going to be stuck, and then you're slowly going to go backwards. Because if you don't surrender, you're never going to be able to take a step forward. In Luke Chapter 9, verse 23, it says, And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. 
let him deny himself. That points back to my first point. Figure out the things that do not please God. And if those things are in your life, deny it. Deny it. The second part, and take up his cross daily. You can relate that to my second point, things that please God. Things that please God, take those up daily. Implement them into your life daily. Work on yourself daily. We don't get better all of a sudden many times. Usually it's an increment of bettering yourself through spending time with God and in his word. And finally, and follow me. The third point, how to please God, following him. So it all fits together. If we deny ourselves, first we have to figure out the problem, our own issues. Second point, take up his cross daily. Figure out what God likes, what pleases him, and do them. And then finally, follow me, how to please God. So let's be aware of that. Our focus in this life should be focused on pleasing him, not ourselves. Not ourselves. And let me tell you, there's so much, life is so much more better when you seek a life where you please God. Because he sees everything. Because he knows the future far better than we do. Can you tell what's going to happen tomorrow? Well, God does. And he, he sets up things for you every single day. He sets up opportunities for you every single day. So why not take the guarantee? Why not take that guarantee of living a better life? Because God has a better life prepared. Or you can choose your path. And no, you're not really sure where that leads because you don't know the future. So if you want to please the Lord, seek him and implement those changes that you find that need to be done in your life. Because we all have them. And we're not perfect. But if we want to please the Lord, we need to do that. We need to change those things in our lives. And in the end, your life will be so much more better. So in conclusion, I showed you attributes that don't please the Lord. Uh, the flesh. Uh, and I showed you works of the flesh. And then also faithfulness. Without faithfulness, you cannot please God. I showed you things that do please God, being blameless, being acting faithful, being righteous, doing what is good, and sharing what you have. And then also with Solomon, in the manner in which you ask, or what you ask God for. Be selfless in what you ask for. And I pray that you guys will grow from this and that you guys will implement a few things in your life figure out what's your thing that's holding you back and then figure out how to change that and then finally implement those changes in your life do something about it and if you do this daily 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 you're going to be able to please God because you're going to get closer to him because you're going to be able to hear his voice and to be able to do the will that he has in store for you. May God help us. God bless you all.